Hello, what have we here? And welcome to another episode of the There Are More of Us show, where we celebrate creators spreading positivity and joy through their love of Star Wars. Today's episode features author Stephen Barnes. Stephen first joined the galaxy far, far away when he wrote a book called The Cestus Deception, which was a Clone Wars novel in 2004. And he also wrote a book called Star Wars Saved My Life, Be the Hero in the Adventure of Your Lifetime in 2015. He now returns to a galaxy far, far away to write the Glass Abyss, a Mace Windu novel, set to come out later this year. So stick around and learn more about Steven and his Star Wars story here on the There Are More of Us show. There are more of us. Hello, what have we here? Welcome to the show, author, sci-fi writer, Stephen Barnes. Greetings, Chris. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. All that polite talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for those that are not familiar uh, with your work, both Star Wars and beyond, what kind of content do you make? What kind of content do I make? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I haven't been asked that before. But uh, short stories, novels, teleplays, screenplays. Um, I've worked in multiple genres, you know, science fiction, fantasy, horror, suspense, mystery, just, you know, kind of straightforward writing, mostly mm -hmm. writing. Um, but I also do a lot of uh, non-fictional instruction on general life goals and achievement and balance using Campbell's model of the hero's journey and other tools to, uh, to guide that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've uh, written for Star Wars before, uh, back in yeah. uh, the er early days of the Clone Wars multimedia project with, what was it, the Kestis Deception or the Cestus Deception? Cestus Deception. The Cestus yeah. Deception. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, it's, I get Cal Kestis and I think Kestis for everything. It's similar, but not the exact same. <laughs> Um, and now you had uh, a few years ago, well, I guess several years ago, because we're in 2024 now, which makes time is weird. Uh, but you did a book called How Star Wars Saved My Life. And, yes, I did. Yeah. And now you uh, this year, you're coming out with The Glass Abyss, which is a novel focusing on Mace Windu. Yes, indeed. That is true. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, I definitely do want to get into How Star Wars Saved My Life, but I'll, I'll save that for later. Uh, although it may tie into this next question, but what is your Star Wars story? You know, how'd you get into it? What made you fall in love with it? Well, um, I guess I was working at Pepperdine University when it mm -hmm. came out. And the lady that I was, uh, I had dated, you know, said that she'd seen it and thought it was really good. And just considering that she was not really a science fiction fan, I thought that was unusual. I mean, I'd seen the 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 first trailer for it and interestingly mm -hmm. enough the trailer looked kind of worn i mean it looked like they played it a lot and it was kind of worn out so i wasn't all that impressed to be honest i mean it looked okay but mm -hmm. um i saw it for the first time probably in the pacific theater on hollywood boulevard that sounds right it was either that or the Grauman's chinese i think it was the pacific theater um and is the instant that uh imperial cruiser went across the screen you know, I was hooked. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's like that. Um, because we'd never seen effects like that linked to a propulsive story. Mm -hmm. um, there had been effects that were roughly on the same level in terms of individual things. I mean, 2001 A Space Odyssey or even, uh, 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 God, I forget what, what it was. Uh, the H.G. Wells, uh, or was it Jules Verne, Harryhausen film about the moon had some shots that were really quite, quite excellent. Um, but in terms of like motion control movement with ships bobbing and weaving and so forth, and then the propulsive storyline and the John Williams music, it just, it was the complete package. Mm -hmm. They'd really, they'd, they'd really put together something that allowed people to feel like I have not seen this before. Mm -hmm. And so we were as a as a group, um, you know, science fiction fans at the time, most of us really willing to overlook any issues that we might have had with it. And there are always issues to be had with anything and to realize that we were looking at history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I guess that answers your question. Yeah. 
Uh, and, and so uh, after, you know, the original trilogy came out, you, you got a, uh, to be a part of the prequel era. Uh, yeah. What, how, how, was, how was that experience going from fan to creator? Um, well, I mean, I, of course, I'd, I'd probably written 10, 12 novels at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they came to me and, and asked me whether or not I'd be interested. And uh, as a general principle, I was going to be interested uh, as a specific principle. Actually, no, that's not what happened at all. What happened was that I that Betsy Mitchell, who was the editor at Warner's, wanted me to write two novels set in prehistoric Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told her that I couldn't do that unless I had the time to do the research and actually could travel to Tanzania to do field research. And so to enable me to do that, I got a two book contract plus a Star Wars contract, which gave me the money that I needed to have the time that I needed to write this other book. So um, I got in touch with Lucasfilm or they got in touch with me and they flew me to uh, Skywalker Ranch. Uh, and I spent a couple of days there talking with them and we beat out, uh, I think Matt, Matt Stover was there, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we beat out the stories. Uh, and then I went away and, and wrote. Uh, so it was, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I was living, where was I? I, I was I living, I might've been living in, in Vancouver, Washington at the time. That's possible. Um, or in Longview, Washington. I, I'm not sure exactly. I'd have, I'd have to check the dates. But I think I was living up in Washington at the time. So um, going to Skywalker Ranch was a hoot of course, mm -hmm. um, and having an opportunity to, to talk about the mythos, to kind of see, well, where, where can I insert myself into this process and do something that I would have fun with, mm -hmm. uh, with the theory that if I'm having fun, the readers will have fun as well. That I also needed to be able to be familiar enough with the, the universe and I didn't want to have to read a bunch of Star Wars novels. Uh, so I read one book of Star Wars short stories. It was like Tales from the Spaceport Bar or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I would rewatch the movies over and over again. And then I forget what resource I had in terms of research. There wasn't a Star Wars encyclopedia at the time, but there may have been some, some research material, but then there were there were people who I had access to who had answers to the questions. So I deliberately set out to design a story that was separate from some of the Star Wars universe because I didn't want to get caught up in the minutiae of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were people or fans who understood the universe much better than me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to get caught up in accidentally saying, you know, something about R2-D2's circuitry or something that somebody said, oh, no, no, in, in this book, they did this. <laughs> no, 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 not interested in that. I just wanted to tell a story set in that universe uh, that contained values that I embrace as a storyteller and mm -hmm. that would have some little fragment of truth in there someplace um, and also would be kind of a hoot. You know, I, I there, there were jokes, there were in-jokes that I put in. I suspect that most Star Wars writers do that. Mm -hmm. uh, there were in-jokes that I put in there that, that were callbacks. Uh, there was a scene, one of the scenes in that book was stolen from a story I wrote when I was like 11 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and you better believe that I was laughing my butt off while I was I was writing it. And the, the little kid inside me, that, that the little creative imp, was just delighted to, you know, that, that something he came up with all that, all those years ago was something that I was getting very well paid for today. So it's like, you know, you, you have, yeah, if I set it up to do something that I thought would be a good book and would be a fun book to write, and I had a, a particular period of time to do it in, and I had these strictures. So there's the strictures are clear. And I think that going into a project like this, you understand that the world doesn't belong to you. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it barely belongs to Lucasfilm. You know, it belongs to Lucasfilm and it belongs to the fans. So what I, I wanted very much to keep that in mind while I was doing it. And I wanted to do something that the fans would be happy with. Mm-hmm. I really did. You know, that, that was very important to me. It always is. You know, the, the audience is important to me. I remember reading, so uh, not when that book came out, I was 10. Uh, so I was reading, it was, you know, either a library trip with my mom or dad, or it was, you know, on Sunday night, it's like, all right, we're going to Barnes and Nobles for three hours, go pick out a book. And, and I would <laughs> go and I would sit there and read. And I remember the, the bio droids were like the coolest thing to me. Cause I was like, oh no, like if they get them, it's over. Like, you don't even <laughs> need to know about Revenge of the Sith. That's a game. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I mean, mm-hmm. frankly, it's uh, that's satisfying to me, you know, to to feel, you know, art is self-expression, but successful art is self-expression where people understand what it is that you were trying to communicate, and they feel that it is a positive thing in their life that mm-hmm. it 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 helps them to to reduce stress or move away from pain or embrace joy or gain a new perspective such that it is worth the amount of money that they paid for it. I mean, one of my mentors made the comment that, or maybe, yeah, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was Robert Heinlein or maybe it was Jerry Pornell that a book has to be at least as entertaining as a six pack of beer because <laughs> they cost the same thing, you know? So um, the, the notion of writing something that is entertaining as well as something that moves your career forward and expresses your values about writing and life and what it is to be human you know all those things come in there and then on top of those things it's you know what what would be a good star wars story what do we expect Mm -hmm. from a star wars story what is that about and to look at the most successful Star Wars movies and ask, what is it that the fans are falling in love with here? And, you know, I think that every every person, every fan or writer, or whatever, is going to have their own theories about that. And I think there's going to be a lot of agreement, but there's also going to be some eccentric, you know, uh, observations. Well, I think that this is what they're going for. Or I think that this is what it is. And then you do your very best job to live up to it. Mm-hmm. You know, what else can you do, really? Yeah. Uh but speaking as a fan of you, uh, as uh, you are, uh, I'm going to ask you about some of your favorites uh, uh, that you have. So uh, as an author, a uh, longtime writer, what is your favorite Star Wars book? Like I said, I don't read Star Wars books. Mm-hmm. I read the collection of short stories. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's been the movies and you know now the Disney Plus shows, which I mm-hmm. enjoy very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, then who are three of your favorite characters from any Star Wars material, any era? Hmm. Well, I think like everybody else, I certainly love Grogu. Hmm. Um, you know, baby Yoda, and I love Yoda. Um, and I love Darth Vader, you know, because um, six of the movies are about the Skywalker family. You know, maybe you could say maybe nine of them are in some ways, but when you realize that so much of the saga is about a specific family struggling against the emperor, then, you know, Darth Vader is genuinely a a tragic character there. Mm -hmm. And then he has a, a, an enormous fall and a slight redemption, you know, Mm -hmm. little Susan, a dash of redemption after a lifetime of, of evil um sufficient so yeah i guess those those three characters uh, i always i always like i mean in uh if i were to outside the main the main thrust the main arc of the stories i mean like a lot of other people i think that rogue one was really Mm -hmm. well done it was really well done there were a lot of things to really love about that movie. They, 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 they pulled off, they pulled off something very difficult. And in that sense, um, probably Donnie Yen's character, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, cheer it. you know, it just, uh, there are, there are so many 
things. I mean, George Lucas created such a rich universe there that it really is possible to find dozens of different values that he embraced and expressed with great expertise. Um, just enormously entertaining films. Mm -hmm. And I think that they have, yeah, I'm going to answer a question you haven't asked, which is, you know, what is, what is my favorite moment mm -hmm. in the Star Wars movies? And I think it would be the one that I think it's from the first movie. And I think it's the moment at which Star Wars became something bigger than a soap opera or a space opera. It was the moment when Luke is in the trench, you know, and uh, his wingmen have been blown up and, and, you know, Grand Moff Tarkin is saying, fire up the laser and, and then Carrie, Carrie Fisher with the cinnamon buns on the side of her head is looking very pensive and John Williams music is going boom, 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 boom. And all these spaceships are moving and all these things are happening all at the same time. It's utterly overwhelming uh, and the stakes are just stupendous. And in the midst of all this, Obi-Wan's voice says, trust your feelings. Mm -hmm. At that moment, to me, the metaphor was that we're in a world, and Alvin Toffler talks about future shock, that is moving faster and faster, and it can seem that individual human beings don't mean anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all of this overwhelming technology and speed and explosions and everything else, we're being told that our hearts still matter, that the individual human heart that human courage friendship matter i think that that was the moment at which star wars became modern mythology i feel like that answered not the favorite moment question that i had but the question that i and i think you could you could still expand on it which would be uh what is it about star wars that is able to connect people from all walks of life, from all over the world, across ages and demographics to to unite them in their love for something when it unites people. Um, I think that okay, Star Wars is fantasy um, using science fiction image systems. And science fiction is primarily asking, not always, but primarily asking the question, you know, there are two questions in art who am I and what is true or what is it to be human and what is the universe in which human beings live? Most science fiction is about the structure of the universe. Mm -hmm. Fantasy is more about the internal structure of consciousness. The, as long as it is internally consistent, you don't worry about whether or not we know why dragons can fly or, or breathe fire. Mm -hmm. the question is, do we believe the human beings that are moving through this? And I think that the, embracing the mythology of it you know that we're, this is a world of wizards and dragons you know and magic swords i think that that allows us and, and because he did the job well and he understood joseph campbell's structure so well i think that it's a dream it's dream logic you know, the, the, if you're trying to figure out the timeline in Empire Strikes Back is impossible. How long <laughs> were they, you know, I mean, how long was Luke with, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is, do you believe that, that Yoda is mentoring Luke into the next phase of his being? Do you believe that, that you know, if you believe that, then you understand that such change takes place outside of time anyway. It's not mm -hmm. about, you know, you train with the teacher for 10 years. It's about you train with the teacher until something, until a switch flips in your head mm -hmm. and you start becoming a different person. You start understanding that you're not what you thought you were when you walked in the door. That's certainly mm -hmm. true in any number of different disciplines, including, you know, martial arts. Um, and I think that that's the secret that, that the, relationship to the human heart and our aspirations as individuals and groups is the core of things and there's all sorts of nice you know techno babble you know, on the surface but that's not what it's about and it's not what it was ever about nobody really cares about that stuff what mm -hmm. we care about is the the exploration and growth of the hero um 
it's asking the question, who are you? If, and I think that Star Wars became modern mythology because a large number of people look at the characters and the situations in there and they felt something and i think that it changed science fiction there are ways in which <laughs> there are ways in which change science fiction fandom forever and not necessarily for the better um Fair. this science fiction fandom up until that time was homogeneous in the sense that you you were a group of outsiders who loved science fiction and if you wanted to talk about science fiction, you had to go to a science fiction club mm. or you had to go to a science fiction convention because the outside world thought you were nuts. But when Star Wars came out, you could suddenly start talking science fiction or Star Wars with people who were standing in front of you at the line of the supermarket. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like suddenly everybody was into this stuff. It suddenly it went mainstream at that point in a way that it never had before. And I think that it changed science fiction fandom and expanded an awful lot of fans who were used to the sort of clicky, this is our this is our club. Like you know, you kept us out of the club when we were in junior high school, but now this is our club. A lot of them had to deal with the fact that everybody wanted it at that mm -hmm. point. So the it, but not only that. Uh, there's something that I could say that wouldn't be <laughs> wouldn't be as nice as as, as I want to be. Um, I will leave it at that. <laughs> that suddenly the private club was being invaded, and there were people who were not comfortable with that. Yeah, I feel like that's part of why I do this show is because there are so many people that believe that this only belongs this this thing that we love called star wars only exists in for a certain group of people and it's like no there are more of us that love star wars and it's affected our yeah. lives in so many different ways and that's i mean i think that people who feel like they've been outsiders need to feel like there's something that belongs to them mm -hmm. and so you can have a a, a maladaptive response to such things mm -hmm. because you know, the, the truth is that we all feel like we're outsiders. You know, we all, that's just existential despair, man. Just, we all feel like there's no one who understands us and so forth and so on. And we want to find tribe and where are we going to find partners and mates? And, you know, I don't want to be an incel, you know, and whatever it is that you're thinking. And there are times when you can hold on too tightly to what you believe is yours and it can feel painful. I mean, I actually have had conversations about this not more than a couple of weeks ago with people talking about how the real science fiction, you know, conventions are, are dying, mm -hmm. you know, at the same time that you get, you have gigantic conventions like Dragon Con and Comic Con and so forth, but those aren't real science fiction conventions. You know, it's the purists, you know, and I think that that idea of science fiction, you know, the golden age of science fiction is when you were 12 mm -hmm. is not is not always said with affection. Yeah, I think that there is truth in there that does not need to be a, a denigration at all. It's saying that, that when you're 12, 13, 14, your heart is really open. You're adult enough. You're, you're, you're mature enough to to see the bigger world, but you have enough that childhood wonder to still believe in miracles you know you still you can still believe that that the world will embrace your dreams that it will give you opportunities so you read about you read science fiction and you know my golden age you know when i was at well you know it was, it was writers like isaac asimov and robert heinlein mm -hmm. you know who were saying you know the universe is yours if you have the courage and the heart and the mind to embrace it um, I don't know what would be the equivalent of that now, but I know it exists. I know it's mm -hmm. out there because there's, you know, tons of stuff that's being published. So there is a way that one of the secrets to life, as you become a wiser and wiser adult, um, you can, you'll lose all of your joy if you become too adult and don't keep touch with that child part and you're going to have a disastrous life if you cater too much to the child and don't develop your adult mm -hmm. so i think that that the image of the of the jedi knight is appealing for a number of different reasons 
um, in that stuff. I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much about what's in the new book, mm -hmm. um, but some of the questions were, you know, what can I do here? You know, what is, what am I allowed here? And one of the things I can say is that they're very clearly trying, they're experimenting with letting the universe mature. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a very good thing, you know, mm -hmm. that you move it beyond just being children's literature. It never was. Right. It was literature and, and it was movies for the child in the adult self. Uh, but I think that they're asking different questions now, and I think that those are good questions to ask mm -hmm. uh, about what is the what is the place of Star Wars, what is the place of mythology, you know, what is what is here, um, and I was very pleased, you know, I it was uh, when we I'm sure you'll eventually have a question about how exactly that came to be, and I'll I'll, I'll say that. But I think that that's kind of a wandering answer to your question. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully no, I've answered it. No, I think you have, and I appreciate that. Uh, before we get to uh, the briefly talking about how the Glass Abyss came to be, uh, what uh, is your favorite Star Wars quote? Probably Yoda. Try not, do or do not. There is no try. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, the other one would be another Yoda quote, you know, is after Luke says, I don't believe it. He said, that is why you right, fail. Yep. There is, uh, there's some real truth to that mm -hmm. uh, in terms of life and in high levels of performance. Uh, I, I'd absolutely agree with that. I know, I think that, that Yoda and Luke on Dagobah changes. It's, it's like a, the switch flipping in in Star Wars mythology that I think shapes not only, you know, Return of the Jedi, but it shapes the prequels and even the sequels in terms of what is the force. You know, there are within the structure of a fictional universe where a number of different creative minds have had a stab at things. It's never going to be totally consistent. Mm -hmm. Even if you had, you know, the story about, you know, the blind men and the elephant, where, you know, one, you know, they're all touching the elephant, which I'm sure the elephant was thrilled with. Um, and one says the elephant is like a spear, if he's touching the tusk. One says the elephant is like a snake, he's touching the, the trunk. In other words, it's like a rope, he's touching the tail, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and what if there was a force? If the force was real, then there would be a lot of different opinions about what it is and how to use it and how to approach it and a lot of different rules and laws and different religions and so forth and so on. Because um, there are a lot of different routes up the mountain. Um, there, there might not be as many as if people were talking about a supernatural force that did not exist. And mm -hmm. the reason is that if it doesn't exist and everybody makes up what they want it to be mm -hmm. or what they think it's not. Whereas if it does exist, you know, if you're going to have more agreement about the nature of a mountain, you know, a, a pictures of Mount Everest, than you will have about the lives and existence of dragons. Mm -hmm. um, because dragons can take, infinite forms and you can say anything you want to about them as long as it's consistent because it doesn't have to correspond right if you're talking about the force you're talking about you know a and is that a reification of concepts like holy spirit ki chi prana numa um you know other things from many different cultures and, and many different disciplines um and the most important thing was always that it fulfill a story purpose. Mm -hmm. It was always about fulfilling a story purpose more than relating to something that is real outside the story universe. It can be a metaphor for how we view these things, but it's slippery mm -hmm. because you, 
you sometimes need the force to do new things. It's like from time to time, Superman, you know, pops up with a new power. We've never yep. seen that before. Wait a minute. He'd kiss Lois <laughs> Lane and make her forget. Where did that come from? <laughs> Gotta like, love Superman what? too. <laughs> what? Um, so, um, you know, from my own perspective, I wanted to be conservative. You know, I never had the force do anything we hadn't seen it doing before. Mm -hmm. um, I would tend to look for things that were sort of unexplored pockets, things that were said and that then didn't follow up on or things that were shown, but it's like, oh, we could go back in there. Um, but it's not up to me to expand the mythology in that sense. It's it's up to me to to clarify what's going on within the mythological structure or within the, the story universe that has been set up by many other writers mm -hmm. uh, and producers and directors over decades. So it's like, let me find a little, little pocket in there and things like the force, which are central to this, which are wonderful operating metaphors for our relationship with the universe. If we view the universe as being a living thing, it's 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 a fine metaphor it's a powerful one uh and i would hope that any writer who approaches that understands that they're playing with fire yeah uh and you you've touched on this before when you were talking about uh the your favorite moment with luke and talking about when uh john williams when you were watching the new hope uh for the first time uh right. star wars is nothing without its music uh yes. so what is your favorite musical piece from star wars well, it's probably Darth Vader's theme. You know, the bum, 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 yep. bum, bum. Well, we know it. <laughs> Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. You hear it, you just, you just want to walk to it. You want that to be your soundtrack to life. That's right. All right. Now, who uh, doesn't want, you know, yeah, Darth Vader is a great, is a great bad guy, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not, he, he's not quite as evil as people ordinarily say. You know, he's not the one who blew up Alderaan. Right. That was Grand Moff Tarkin. Right. You know, so yeah, he's an evil son of a bitch, but he's not the embodiment of evil. Yeah, but hey, he's such a great character. I dedicated yeah, yeah. eight months to making a screen accurate Empire Strikes Back cosplay. Uh, but I can understand that completely. <laughs> uh, so you have the the Glass Abyss coming out. Uh, I believe it's in April, right? Or is it August? No, no. It's, I think it's like they're talking August or something. Okay, like August. Yeah, well, it's, not even, it's not even completely finished. I mean, okay. it's the first draft is finished. And I've gotten notes back, but now I'm working on the notes. And I'll be working on those notes for really hard for two and a half weeks. And then I'm taking off from Manila for a week. Uh, and then I'll address whatever comes. Probably the, it'd be time for Lucasfilm to to uh, give me another, another round of notes. Right now I'm dealing with the editor's notes. Mm -hmm. okay well august well if it comes out in august that'll be happy birthday to me <laughs> uh so how did how did uh the process of uh getting involved with the glass abyss and doing a book on mace windu that i've been asking for for years <laughs> okay oh he, 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 i would assume you read shatterpoint yes okay but you're still asking for a Mace Windu novel. That's yes. interesting. It sounds it sounds to me like there might be something unsaid in that comment. Um, <laughs> oh I, no, no, no! I love I love Matthew Stover's work, but it's like since canon has been uh, uh, set under Lucasfilms uh, with Disney since 2014, there is a lack of content around Mace Windu that isn't focused on him. Yeah, yeah, we don't even know if he's dead or alive. Um, <laughs> In my mind, in, in my mind, he survives, you know, mm -hmm. um, but that's another story. Uh, so what happened is I was working, I was working in television. I actually hadn't written a solo novel in, in several years. Um, and that was not an accident. I wanted to focus my attention on Hollywood uh, for a variety of reasons that are, are outside the, the threat of today's symposium. Uh, and uh, I was working on, I was, for six weeks, I was doing a writer's room on the Friday the 13th television series, Crystal Lake, with Brian mm -hmm. Fuller. Um, and that was a brilliant experience. I mean, it was like so much fun. It was so educational. I learned so much. But almost the minute that room ended, I got a call from my agent, who I had not heard from in quite a while, uh, asking me if I'd be interested in writing a Mace Windu novel. 
that Star the Star Wars people had reached out and wanted me. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not ask specifically why they wanted me, um, but I said, well, let me talk to them. And uh, I had in mind one very specific condition under which I'd write it. And I'm not going to say what that condition is because okay. it would give away a plot point. But I will say that I wanted, I wanted the right to do something in particular with mm -hmm. Mace. And they said, you know, and if they said no, I might have written it anyway because, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's good money. Right. But when they said yes, I realized that I had a unique opportunity here to mm -hmm. contribute to the mythos in a way that would make the little boy inside me very happy. And I suspect you're going to be happy with it, Chris. Uh, but <laughs> I'm not going to say Sold. it. Maybe when we're off the air, I'll tell you what it is. But um, I don't want to give away any plot points because I felt I was very grateful to them. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, really? You, I can do this? Um, and so I set out to so the next step after that after kind of talking through my basic the basic uh notions uh i had to create an outline mm -hmm. you know was, I don't, was it three pages five pages i don't know something like that um of a way i saw the story could go mm -hmm. they approved they there were a few things that i had to change of course you know it's their world i'm just you know i'm just living in it for a short time. I'm just mm -hmm. renting a room in it for a short time. I know it's not my world. Um, and it's important, I think, to remember that when you're working in a franchise, that it's not mm -hmm. your world. It's not your ego. You're there to serve the company. You're there to serve the fans, not just to express yourself. Mm -hmm. If I were to write this book without those concerns, it would be a different book. Mm -hmm. My task was to write a Stephen Barnes novel that sets that takes place in the Star Wars universe starring Mace Windu. Mm -hmm. So you, I get to ask myself the questions. Well, what is a Stephen Barnes novel? What is it that I do that I love doing? That is that somebody who is familiar with my work, if they read that book, would say, oh, that's Steve. If whether they, you know, whether they knew saw my name on the cover or not, they say, oh, this is the kind of book that Steve Barnes would write. And I think that all artists develop a style, a rhythm, uh, a patois, uh, a, a set of images or thematics that they love, that they express. So I had my conversation with Lucasfilm, Zoom meeting, and it went very well. Mm -hmm. And they agreed to let me do the things I wanted to do, and they agreed that that the path that I wanted to go down was a solid one. So I got them to send me a bunch of research material, mm -hmm. most of which, you know, there were several books that I was able to make good use of, but I didn't really use them when I was working on the first draft. Mm -hmm. Working on the first draft, what I would do is I'd rewatch the first three Star Wars movies and then the best, what I thought were the best of the others. So I could catch the kind of the feeling of it. Uh, and because having lived in that universe for all this time, I know it. I don't need to look at a map of my neighborhood to walk around the block. Mm -hmm. But but that's for the big moves. In the rewrite process, I've got to get everything right. That's where the, the research books came in. So mm -hmm. I had done, you know, 40 years of research in one sense. Right. Um, but in another sense, you know, in order to get very specific details, you know, where did this alien come from and what are their characteristics? And I can do, so, you know, Google is your friend, you know, it's about yeah. things like that, but also the research books were my friend. So I wrote it and I wrote it um, in a slightly different way than a lot of writers do. I tend to write the entire first draft without any polishing at all. Mm -hmm. Just get it out. And the rest of it is reworking it. And, and when you rework it, you know, I'm looking for what my unconscious mind was doing. You know, what, what Stephen King refers to as the boys in the basement. The, mm -hmm. the part, the unconscious part of you is the part that's the real writer. You know, there's the, there's the conscious mind is the editor and it can type, but mm -hmm. there is a, a deeper wisdom. And as long as, if my emphasis was on creating the best book I could, 
within the time frame I had, within the story structures that they had given, um, then I knew that I had the potential to do something I could be proud of. And that's that's what I'm doing right now with the rewrite. If I think, mm-hmm. okay, the story works. The editor likes the story. My wife, you know, has read it and likes the story. Um, but there are values that I can bring out. Now it's, you know, I've, if I've assembled a rough cut, now is the time to polish and trim and work on the sound and the color balancing and music you know and the things that turn it from well i can see something up there on the screen i mean i remember seeing the predator Mm -hmm. when it first before it came out at 20th century fox and the the there was no music and uh a lot of unfinished effect shots and so forth so on but i could tell this was going to be a classic but you wouldn't have wanted to show that movie to the audience. You, you you needed to add the music and the final effect shots and balance the color and all those other things. And now you have a classic. So the same thing would be true about any book. I I I did a I assembled a rough cut so that I could see the entire thing in front of me, so I could see, get it out of my head and onto paper. And so now it's going to be a dialogue between the Google Doc and the printed copy where I go over it and I I make notes and I need to follow each of several major characters through the entire story and be sure that they have moments that pay off powerfully. Uh, I have to work on the poetics, the the use of language and imagery, the pacing of things and every scene has to be moving at a particular pace and the the emotional bridges the you know it starts positive and ends negative in this scene or it starts positive and ends more positive or it starts negative and gets even more negative whatever it is there's a there are varied rhythms within the story and i have to make sure that each scene each each line you know follows those rhythms that every page has something rewarding for the reader there's something on every when i when i like to write polish things until you could po- you could turn to any page and find something that pops mm-hmm. it's like oh that's cool oh that's fun oh that's you know that's that's interesting um it, at that point it feels you, you know if you just have the plot aspects it's what one of my mentors referred to as a bald and unconvincing narrative mm-hmm. yeah the story it pieces work but you're doing a puppet show and how do you get people to react emotionally to splotches of ink on a page it's a Mm -hmm. different question from splotches of color and sound on a screen you're you're presenting a puppet show to them but you're asking them to forget the strings Mm -hmm. you're asking them to forget that we all know that it's puppets and I think you do that by giving those puppets integrity within the puppet universe. You believe in these puppets. You believe that that they are what they are. That they have feelings and so forth. And if you relate it, if you re, if I can relate the actions of supernatural beings to human emotions that we understand, so it's like, well, if I were Mace Windu, I, yeah, I'd feel that way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, then people suspend their disbelief. And they're willing to slip into the world and they're willing to trust you and once you have their trust you have the responsibility to deliver and so that's hmm, once again another long answer to a short question but a beautiful answer that uh, i think a lot of people are going to appreciate and be able to draw from so thank you so much no you're very welcome you know i love writing i've always loved writing since childhood this is what I do. This is who I am. And when someone asks me to play in their sandbox like this, I take it very seriously. You know, this is, I, it's as serious as anything else that I could possibly write within the fact that I, I don't have as much time to write it as might be ideal or perfect. It's sufficient mm-hmm. to create something I'm proud of. And that's, that's enough. Well, thank you again for coming on to the show. Before uh, we wrap up, where can people uh, find you either online or 
uh, any of their other books that uh, you've written? Well, you go to uh, www.stephen-barnes.com and you'll find my website. You can jump, uh, get onto my mailing list where I talk about writing and life and you know mastering the force in your own existence, so to speak, at stephenbarneslist.com. And if you do that, uh, you know I I love interacting with with fans. Well, uh, thank you. Make sure everybody you check out uh, Steven's work, not only in the Star Wars universe with the Glass Abyss coming out in August. I did look it up August uh, of this year, uh, but some of his other work because uh, he's been writing uh, wonderful novels for a long time. So thank you again, Steven. And remember, everyone, until next time, there are more of us. <laughs>